thanks everyone for, for taking the time um, as always. I know for some of you, this is the first sort of discussion with Third Republic and um, the round table. A few of you obviously have been here before. So obviously great to see some new faces as well. Yeah, it's been a bit of a crazy year for, for business with regards to COVID. So, you know, forcing businesses to change their operating model, you know, becoming fully remote, having to innovate far quicker than they'd probably anticipated this speaking with you all individually over the last sort of six weeks the topic kind of picked itself obviously businesses having to pivot innovate obviously to survive in the sort of current climate i'll i'll, I'll let tanner sort of take the floor now and um yeah introduce himself so today i will be talking about innovation management quick introduction i'm tanner i have started my career at microsoft so I worked at Microsoft around four years, then I have started my own analytics company at Silicon Valley, which name was App Analytics. We became the second fastest growing B2B startup at App Analytics in the world, according to Business Insider. And uh, I sold my company to Nomad Commerce in 2016. And then I became an uncle and have decided to move to same time zone with my family. And I moved to Berlin and joined WebTrack as a VP of product. It was a private data management platform in the beginning that we pivoted it to the uh, customer intelligence platform, especially GDPR compliant, so which helped us to become the fifth biggest analytics solution in the world, according to Business Insider, uh, sorry, uh, Forrester Research. And now we sold the company to MapClouds in 2018. Then I joined Finleap Universe to one of their small venture Finreach. We were 11 people with four engineers. And we were doing Conto Excel service. I don't know, are you aware, but in Germany, whenever you have any bank account, uh, you have to notify all your direct debitors, such as your electricity contractor or internet contractor. And you're supposed to send them a letter that, hey, this is my new bank account from now on, deduct money from the new one. So we were digitalizing that uh, process. So uh, during that time, uh, there was a regulations, new financial regulations, which name was PSD2. So uh, then I have decided to build a financial API platform over there. So far, uh, the things went well, and we became the leading financial API platform of Europe. We have started to connect approximately 65 million bank accounts per month uh, with more than 700 financial institutions as a customer and processing more than 8 billion transactions every month. And we became Finleap Connect as a renamed our company. Uh, our mother company was Finleap. So uh, Finleap divided itself to ABC and we became Finleap Connect. So, so far, I mean, the story, especially my entrepreneurial story was more around creating the impact of the companies that I have started or that I've joined. But the thing is, I am not Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or uh, taller or smarter or more handsome than the other people. So uh, the only thing is there was a framework that I was following since uh, a penaltics time that I have studied at Stanford University from my teacher, Marilyn Lee Patterson. And I just implemented that framework and I have tried to implement or adapt the learnings of the big companies already uh, to my existing companies. So that actually created the difference. So today I'm going to a little bit go uh, and I would like to deliver that framework. But before I would like to talk a little bit about the innovation and I would like to connect the topic over there. So George Orwell has a very nice saying. He says that who controls the past controls the future and who controls the present controls the past. So for understanding the innovation, I think we have started to a little bit go with the history of uh, industrial revolution. Everything has started with industry 1.0. Industry 1.0 was scientific management times like Henry Ford, Frederick Taylor. So there was unlimited amount of demand into the market and you were able to sell as much as car that you produce. And all the game was around like how fast I can produce, how much I can produce more. And it's the exact time that assembly lines and those kind of things have invented. And then very soon, production concept passed to the product concept, which is industrial 2.0, which means that the limited, the demand started to get limited and still the supply was limited. And then, Henry Ford, I mean, the Ford company, for example, start to differentiate their products like the red car, car with a radio or air conditioner. Then, you know, products started to differentiate. And after the time, it was like an unleashed dog 
uh, there was an unlimited supply because all the factories were producing like crazy and the demand got limited. Then we have started to see the vacuum cleaner sellers like Mormons in our door, like knocking the door, hey, do you need a vacuum cleaner? So then sales and marketing concept has started to appear. Brands started to go to the customers. They try to sell a Photoshopped feature and concept of the lives to be able to uh, sell their products. And then now, we are talking about industry 4.0. When we look at the Wikipedia, like, you know, I mean, very well interconnected smart factories and so on. But end of the day, the industry 4.0 is a concept of innovation. The reason is there is unlimited supply. Right now, everyone is producing like crazy, all the big brands. And in the same time, the demand is unlimited too. So I'm changing my phone. But the thing is, the previous version of the phone was eligible to do whatever I'm doing in this form, but I'm changing because this one is recognizing my face. I changed before because the previous one was recognizing my fingerprint. So then we are getting driven by some innovations, some innovative concepts. So in industry 3.0, the marketing was look like this, the sexist, cash, cheap, and ugly. But now the marketing looks like this, more personalized, more trigger-based. So uh, because Right now, when you send a newsletter to a thousand of your users, next week, you will acquire a thousand more users. And next week's new users will not see the content that you have sent this week. So this is why you have to personalize your communication and make it trigger-based. So then even, you know, marketing, which is, you know, very design and communication and subjective topic, start to become an automated processes and so on so far. And one quick question. So this is a sticky note. Is this an innovation? Yes. Who thinks that this is not an innovation? It was an innovation. Or it was an innovation. So today is it an innovation? Who no, it depends what is on this sticker. If it's only the sticker, let's say we have seen already. <laughs> okay, another question. Imagine I built a new water filter which is not using electricity and using some air molecules to filter my water at home for my use. Is it an innovation? Absolutely, that's innovation. So there is actually very tiny border between innovation and invention. For example, sticky note is a very good example of an innovation. But what I have built at home is a great example of invention. So innovation is new idea or invention plus monetization, which means that if there is no monetization, there is no innovation. And I know we are, I mean, uh, in my previous role, I was a CPO, CTO. And to be honest, especially for the technical roles, sometimes the teams uh, getting, uh, decoupled from the, or getting far away from the customers or customers' roles or that, that reality. And if we would like to drive the innovation, we definitely have to understand what is really need into the market and how to make it monetization. Otherwise, we are building great products for our users or for our uh, satisfaction, which I did it before. And this is a simple life cycle of a product every product dies. So that is a destination that all products or all technologies will have. But why we need an innovation? So innovation is actually just for postponing the dog phase of the product. So everything starts with the question mark. And if your product is good, you go with start, then the cash flow, then you go for dog. So if Apple announced a terrible iPhone in next version, people will buy it. And if they announce another terrible version, some people will buy it, but the third time, no one will buy it. So then the whole company will collapse. That we had seen before in blockbusters or that we had seen before in Nokia kind of examples. So innovation is something that you always need to manage to be able to postpone your dog. Then this is driving us to the question of is innovation manageable or not? But before that, let's check the types of innovations. So there are two types of innovations. One of them is evolutionary innovation, which is like 
iPhone or new IBM devices or so on. And another type of innovation is revolutionary innovation. For example, like a light bulb. So still every light bulb pays to General Electric as a patent, so uh, which is invented by Tom Edison. And this was a revolutionary innovation. And to be able to drive the innovation, first, you need the right people also into your organization. And who are the right people? For example, it's very easy. I mean, even my mom knows what I do. So it's very easy to find people into the market who knows what we are doing. But it is very hard to find people, good people, how we are doing. So then these people are becoming engineer or becoming a solution engineer, solving the problem, selling the customers, stretching the borders. And these people are valuable people for the organization. And there are very rare people into the organization who knows why we are doing it. And just one or two people who knows why we are doing it is enough sometimes to disrupt the market. I mean, I sold my own company just because one of my intern gave an advice like, hey, why we are not doing this? And that feature set was the main feature that we sold our company. Sometimes, I mean, knowing the why, for example, is very important. For example, at Finley, when I have first joined, what I had seen, I mean, what drew me for building a financial API platform was, I have started to read like from 1999, like from the Eurozone introduction to the now, uh, how the financial uh, industry evolved, how the interest rate changed, like the interest rate drops, population increases, the technology changes, the flows of the uh, bank customers, the user journeys of bank customers, how much they are bouncing on where. And all that information just brought me an idea that, okay, so for the financial institutions, the amount of, I mean, the profit margin decreased dramatically because of the interest rate. And now financial institutions are looking for new revenue models and new business models that to create new st revenue streams. So this was, for example, my why that I have started to build till the API platform, which, I mean, we can discuss uh, more detailed, uh, maybe later, but then imagine you know why. You, you, you have people who knows why, and you have a lot of whys that you can go. Which one you're supposed to go? Which one is the innovation? Is exactly like a flipping a coin. So managing an innovation is not a different than flipping a coin. When you flip the coin, a lot of people think that it's 50-50 uh, probability for head or tail. But if you can calculate your hitting speed, the gravity, air resistance, all those variables, it is head or tail. There is no probability. So it's same for product management too. So if you can consider all the variables into the market, like new technologies, trends, like market research, complex term market intelligence, customer feedback, whatever. So if you can know everything, there is no probability for the innovation. But unfortunately, we are not God. So uh, we cannot know everything. Then today I'm gonna a little bit explain a framework which can bring some amount of information which can lead us to the uh, leap of faith for these kind of decisions. This is an innovation management framework uh, which is originally designed with my teacher, Marvin Lee Patterson, and we have adapted it to product management. So Marvin is in the founder team of HP. So he was working at HP between 1958 to 1998. And uh, they were following this framework for 40 years and they were growing 100% in every three years. So it was more about on R&D area and we have adapted this to the uh, product management. So when I was a student uh, at Stanford, I was also starting my own business at Penaltics and I was so excited and I went to the Marvin and I said that, hey, Marvin, I'm starting a company named Penaltics and I want to get a consulting from you. He said that, sure. And he gave me a price, which is not something that I could afford. And I went back home and I was sad. And next week I went to Marvin again and I said that, hey, Marvin, you gave me uh, Hasbro as a finishing project, but I would like to do my own company as a finishing project. 
then I can use your office hours and I can get a free consulting from you. And he liked the idea. And then we have started to implement this framework to App Analytics, my own company. Then we adapted to SaaS products that I implement the same framework to WebTrack and to Finleap after years. And every year we still keep in touch with Marvin to see the outputs and evaluate the outputs of the framework. So how the framework works. So simply innovation engine of the organization collects new technologies, trends, market research, competitor market intelligence, internal feedback, digital analytics, customer feedback, hypothesis, so on, to be able to create value added information. We call this as epics or user stories, like you know what is going on in the other world and what we're supposed to build regarding to the opportunities. And then in engineering side, we collect these user stories or the requirements, and then we have started to design future-proof uh, architecture, future-proof software, and future-proof system. So in first box, the product management side, the innovation is driven by new opportunities. And in the engineering side, the innovation is driven by costs and return of investment on the technology side. And right after that, the engineering creates a value-added product or service that users or customers can use it. And then product management joins after the introduction and check the KPIs and performance monitoring. And if the product performs as decided or as uh, estimated, then they keep the product. And if there's some problems, then they start to create a hypothesis, like is it lack of user experience, lack of design or lack of business value and so on. So then the product goes for the iteration. I mean, a little bit more go deeper inside. Simply the main goal of product management, which was software engineering before. So I mean, in 20, 30 years ago, there were software engineers who were preparing a huge amount of the software requirements, like, you know, checking, talking with all those stakeholders and coming up with the requirement document that we were starting to uh, waterfall developments. But right now, regarding to the iterative development, the market, competitor market intelligence and everything has to be constantly checked and the product supposed to go incrementally with the usable versions. So this is why product, this is why right now the requirement engineering yard is getting run by uh, product and engineering together. And the main goal of product management is actually discovering the opportunity in here. And right after the opportunity discovery, product creates a strategy and concept that they can verify with engineering and customer, which leads the product management to leap of faith. Like, okay, we are going to build this or no, we are not going to build that. Whenever they say, okay, we are going to build that, then the program planning, I mean, like our sprints or agile ceremonies, agile uh, project management methods uh, starts to run. And then the technology and program gets planned, the system gets designed and product gets developed and all those tests, reliable engineering, whatever, and then the product introduction. Then, you know, the whole yard is becoming a one yard that you can run with product and engineering together uh, in nowadays. So far, any questions? I have one question, Tanner, if you don't mind. Um, in your previous slide, you had the engineering R&D phase of the product um, development. I would say that maybe this uh, just maybe a tweak to this and or maybe a um, some some other information to clarify there is that what, what do companies do when they are not in an innovation or a greenfield or a startup phase, but they they actually realize costs already in the engineering and R&D phase and that becomes a little bit of a bottleneck to acquire the engineering uh, time and the efforts of, of the engineering staff that are competing for already discovered, known revenue driving uh, priorities? Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a good question. For example, I mean, engineering and R&D, so maybe we can uh, divide that thing to two pieces. One of them is maintaining the existing products. And then the other one is uh, building the new products or uh, doing an R&D part. So, uh, even for maintenance or refactoring of the existing or legacy solution or building the uh, new functionalities, 
I mean, there's supposed to be a business value behind of that. I mean, I work with some banks which had so many amount of core banking inside of that, the huge amount of legacy, but they are not refactoring themselves because it's working. Of course, I mean, it's a failure risk, but in the same time, I mean, if there is no necessity behind of that, sometimes I mean, no need to refactor or no need to change the things. So actually in on the left side, you can see an internal feedback. So how I was managing it is actually, I mean, I was using the weighted scoring out of that. And I had some topics like dependency, penalty, opportunity, risk, complexity, uncertainty, and maintenance. So dependency was coming from all the departments. Penalty was coming from the risk legal, SLA penalty or regulatory penalty. Opportunity was coming from sales. Risk was coming from churn risk, key account management. Complexity and uncertainty was coming from engineering. Maintenance was coming from engineering and IT operations. And we were not for every, of course, uh, tickets, but for quarterly. I mean, besides of the user stories and backlogs, we had quarterly investment topics that we were constantly cooking in our prior backlog. And we were prioritizing them regarding to that refactoring topic or maybe building another product. So sometimes opportunity and risk might be so low, but for example, maintenance might be minus eight. So which is going to make minus eight maintenance, I mean, less maintenance. But if there is not so much value and if it is solvable with money, which means that, you know, I mean, recruiting five, six more people to just maintain it, we were sometimes maintaining it. But yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, this reminds me a little bit of the um, ICE model that some companies use to, to, to weight the value of, of projects that you take up. So, yep. yeah. I mean, we were using three main models, one of them, the Cano model. So differentiators and non-differentiators, which services are non-differentiated, which services are differentiators mm -hmm. for us. Then the product performs always between differentiators and non-differentiators, yeah. value versus complexity diagram, and then the weighted scoring. So with those three main things, we were aligning all the organization and deciding what to build mm -hmm. and how much investment. And, and that takes discipline. I mean, it takes team discipline teams that really know how to keep the model consistent over time and measure things equally. So sure. I mean, my opinion, I mean, regarding to my uh, humble experience, whenever business tech and operations starts to understand themselves and then translate what is going on each other in an understandable level, then it is automatically driving to success. So uh, then the machine uh, and the wheel starts to turn around of that. But of course, I mean, it's not only with these kind of things. So this is for overall organizational prioritization, we can say that. But in here, for example, whenever engineering decides to refactor something regarding the prioritization, then also for IT strategy perspective, we were looking for the three things, like we were checking our IT assets, we were checking our IT organization, and we were checking out like our uh, IT uh, vision, and we were uh, defining the gaps between of that, and then what is the sweet spot or optimal spot uh, to be able to drive the most return of investment. So do we need, we can recruit maybe 100 engineers, but maybe, 40 engineers is the most optimal point then, you know, I mean, it can uh, go best. So then it was uh, getting sold by IT strategy. So the, the framework which you were showing to us, I agree with the example, for example, with the um, flipping coin. So if you have all the parameters that it's a nice example, and I agree with that, but it's from my perspective, a bit far from the reality. So in my experience, maybe your experience is different. Innovation is a very creative process. And it doesn't really follow a workflow or something like this. So everything what you showed here in this kind of diagram is, is I guess, true, but it's much more driven with creative process, I would say. Like it's, it's the un, unusual steps which you usually do. And it's very much driven also by personalities and characters. From my perspective, not so much on data. Like data is an additional thing what helps a lot. But the trigger of innovation is the creativity part, I, I would say. I agree with you, but uh, the thing is when the organization starts to grow, then uh, it's turning more to the organizational learning. An organization is becoming an individual 
then you are not able to rely on the individuals. So, which means that, I mean, you're a very creative CTO or CPO, but when organization starts to grow, when you have five different CPOs with six different business units and so on, so mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, some standards supposed to be able to scalable. So for that scalability, actually, these kind of frameworks are getting important. Maybe, I mean, I can give an example in here. For example, the thing was, when we have decided to build a platform, there were already platforms into the market. And those platforms were calling themselves as financial API marketplaces like Andigit. They were just bringing all those third parties together. But the thing is, I did a very simple mathematical calculation. When I onboard more than 60 different solution providers to single platform, and when I start to connect them each other and support them each other, federate the data, federate the functionalities, then the complexity was going 10 power to 13 of the software. So mm -hmm. 10 power 23 is the number of the stars in the universe. So then there's an opportunity and there's a problem over there. Then we were sitting down with the engineering because if I would just go engineering and say that, hey, I need an account information service. I would like to use these, these, these solution providers. In the future, when I would like to replace it with my own services or when I onboard 20 more, solution providers, then it would collapse. And when we go with that kind of vision, then we have decided to go with more model-driven architecture. Then we have built models in our microservices. And then we decided, and we put our first party or third party services behind of that. And our generic model was covering all of them. And we were routing our service, depends on the service providers, depends on functionality or quality. And whenever there's another best of breed solution into the market, we were bringing it behind of the model and just mapping the metadata and keep continuing to use it or retiring another uh, or retiring the existing service provider out behind of the model without any change for our customers integration. So this made us actually a huge organization, not the code or not the platform that we scaled. So Actually, from the opportunity discovery to the concept generation to validation with engineering to thinking like what we can do, how we can do, and going to the introduction looks very simple, very simple, maybe kind of a technical decision. But end of the day, it created a huge amount of impact, which made us the one into the market. And I'm really curious, why do you have a leap of faith between the two steps of product management to engineering? Because, I mean, after the concept gets validated, so uh, we said that the innovation is supposed to be commercializable. So, for example, I mean, I have never built something before I sold it. So uh, we were running a Lighthouse customer program and we were always onboarding a Lighthouse customer for free, doesn't matter. But what we were doing is, hey, this is the concept. Would you pay for this concept? How much would you pay for this concept? Okay, so... These are your acceptance criteria. I'm gonna send a QA engineer who's gonna write the tests. All the tests are read. I'm not gonna charge anything to you, but whenever the tests are green, then I have started to charge to you. Then you hear your hear the real feedback about your product. Because when you go to your customer and say that, hey, I have an idea like this. What do you think? You know, I mean, you're already in a dinner or something like that. You know, I mean, with a, a board member of a bank, and he says, I mean, he doesn't say that. Oh, Tanar, this is a stupid idea. I mean, he says that. Oh, Tanar, that's a very cool idea. Okay, let's order more. But uh, when you start to ask money, then you hear the real feedback. So this is why I mean, I put the leap of faith over there. Like, if the concept is not feasible or doable by engineering, or it's not buyable by customer in those verification areas, then we don't build it. Then we throw that opportunity or part that opportunity, go for another opportunity. Okay, I, I would just put leap of faith in every step. There is there is a certain risk and there's certainly a certain amount of faith that you take between steps. But okay, I, I understand where you're coming from though. Oh, on this chart, uh, responsibility for the research of the new technologies and trends, are they belongs to the product management or engineering and R&D? Oh, so, I mean, this is for overall organization, so... Okay, so it should be like on the top, basically, right? So I it's mean, not coming to the product. <laughs> yeah, this is not ownership, okay. so 
market research, I mean marketing or competitor market intelligence is happening by marketing, digital analytics or customer feedback, for example, like customer success or customer support team, uh, new technologies trend like engineering team. So this shows that product management is supposed to understand all those kind of or ingest all those kind of different discipline of data. Okay, it's going to be maybe a bit discriminated, but my opinion, the product management is more engineering focus, which has some capabilities of business understanding. Because without technical understanding and without organizational understanding, you just if you just if you are just creating the user stories and if you are just creating the acceptance criteria, it just makes you a project manager, not a product manager. So to be able to be a real product manager, you're supposed to ingest a lot of different discipline of data, in my opinion. So yeah, I mean, uh, so far, this is the framework uh, that we were following to be able to create the experience for our customers. I mean, uh, by the way, on my LinkedIn account, uh, you can find an extensive uh, blog post about this, uh, the data-driven product management. Uh, so which is explaining actually all these new technologies trend market research competitor market intelligence how to make those things numeratic because all these topics are bringing different discipline of data and how you're supposed to centralize this data standardize this data and make it usable for the daily opportunity discoveries or uh, on your daily operations i do, would just like to add that i i really like the point you made about the marketing 3.0 And the new way of reaching people with your innovation, I, I kind of just see parallels in that in the uh, automobile industry. The, the new innovations we've seen, I was always frustrated in the past where I'm American. And the way that a lot of American automobiles have been marketed in the past has been with a marketing 3.0. Aligning the product to an emotion or to an image or to an event, something to get you to cause you to buy the car. Like around Super Bowls, they would just uh, really, really throw a lot of marketing and hype around the automobile and not really tell you much about the automobile. And I saw even um, Volkswagen starting to do this in some, in some ads. Now, I'm not a car person. I don't own a car, but just paying attention to that kind of stuff, it was really something that really, really bothered me. And when, when uh, we, we had a financial crisis in the U.S. that caused the automobile industry in particular to almost go under, it was rescued. But it, to my dismay, it was rescued to come back exactly the same way it was before. And it kind of frustrated me a little bit that we didn't take the time or that opportunity to really push into new innovation and force innovation into um, electric automobiles, for instance, or driverless cars, for instance. That came kind of as an afterthought once, once you know, the, the industry or the, the demand led them there. So I thought that was kind of a missed opportunity. But where I see, and again, I'm not a Tesla person either, but where I see innovation coming is with with an automobile brand like Tesla, where I see that they pay attention to the customers and what is actually, what is the actual demand? And they keep their eye on the customer and they've come out with some really pretty innovative stuff, not just around the electric, the fact that a cars are electric, but around how they bundle the, the auto driving package into their cars or the other creative stuff that they do in, in the, um, the, the smart, the, the different tiers and you, how you can buy your cars and the packages. I think it's just really creative and that's where I see innovation and that's where I see finally a, um, you know, uh, a marketing 4.0 or innovation 4.0 as you may have described it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I think that's a great, great example. I mean, like in the crisis time, for example, uh, you mentioned something very nice, like the everyone or everything should stop and think to make it a bit further. But mostly, I mean, in innovation thing, that, I mean, sometimes the time is coming like a tsunami and uh, also in the organizations, You need to do the innovation, but you are not able to hit the brake and think sometimes because the organization is going with a full fast. This is why I mean building those muscles into the countries or into the organizations is important. And you gave a Tesla example, for example, I completely agree because electric cars were already exist, but what Tesla did is they built some muscles to drive the innovation electric cars, then they invest it into the battery and they improved the battery technology because they knew that they need battery for making a better car than they invested in autonomous uh, drivers and all those kind of things. So these are actually the muscle things. So uh, this is why those kind of frameworks, I mean, I am really big fan of it.
But I, I think here the difference with Tesla, for example, to other car companies is Tesla is selling innovation. Tesla is not selling cars, really. Tesla is selling innovation. Everything they do, they're trying to push the envelope. Whether you agree with their role models or like everything they yeah. do is a different issue, but they're selling innovation. They're not like the car is just the package to sell innovation. Yeah, you know, he's Elon Musk is doing the same thing with rockets. He's selling innovation in rockets and reusing rocket engines. He's selling innovation in digging holes in the ground. And so his companies are they have products because you have to sell something to make money. You can't just give people ideas and say, here, like I'll take five bucks for that. And a lot of companies and places where you know, myself and other people work now, they sell products which they try to make innovative. But that's kind of, I think Tesla and Elon Musk has flipped it and he's selling innovation and he's sticking innovation onto whatever product will stand still while he's busy stapling it on as it goes past. And that's more the drive. And that's, that's the, I think that's the key change in the whole way that they do things, the way they operate and why they are so far ahead because he's just gone, we're going ahead. That's what I want to do. Get it done. And do you think that that's what's driving the, when the rubber hits the road, I mean, not to create a pun there, but when the real, you know, customers look at this, do you think that they, they see themselves as buying innovation or are they really buying a superior automobile? I mean, cause that's, I think that's really what matters. I, and I would say it's a little bit of both personally. I think it's a bit of both. I, but, and there are people who buy Teslas because they're innovative and because they're cool and because they're yeah. new and because they have all of the stuff that you just listed. And there are people who just buy them because they're like, okay, I need a new car. This is a good car. I'll take that. But nobody buys a Ford F-150 because it's innovative. <laughs> you know, like it's, they buy that because it's always been a Ford F-150, for example. But I think that's also what Tanner's point quite early, well, quite a few minutes ago by now was around what's innovation, right? A Tesla, sure, that's an invention, but it's the monetization part that really matters in here as well, is it, it's only successful because of the monetization opportunity. Hmm. Sure, I mean, other car, other, other uh, brands, electric cars are not as cool as Tesla. I mean, and these examples are getting more and more often, I mean, right? The Elon Musk did it with Tesla, and before I mean, Steve, I mean, I was working at Microsoft in those days, and when we bought Nokia, we were thinking that okay, the iPhone is dead. I mean, like we are gonna destroy Apple. It didn't happen. I mean, like Windows Phone didn't fly, or for blockbusters and Netflix, they were always thinking that okay, we can go digital, but it didn't happen. So the positioning and really driving the innovation is driving also our buying decisions nowadays. Uh, maybe slightly different question. You, you've got product and engineering visually displayed quite separately, which is, you know, fine. However, for me, it's an interesting one. How do you avoid them becoming silos? Because I see that nearly consistently across every company I've worked at, especially if you have them in your model displayed separately. Like, how do you stop that happening? Like, because that's a serious issue especially between engineering and products. I talk about that uh, prioritization meetings that we were doing bi-weekly, like, you know, that we discuss the business values constantly for the next functionalities. So while we are talking about these business values, we are not only assigning numbers and going to the next one. While we are doing this, because I mean, normally this list is not being that crowded. I just pasted something for a placeholder, but normally five, six, main topics you know that you have strategic investment topics and you are talking about them bi-weekly because sales is saying that it's five or six and then you are starting to question that business value okay where is your pipeline how we are going to sell it how is the lighthouse customers what are the first direction engineering is in that round two product is in that round two sales over there and everyone over there and the whole organization is understanding what we are trying to sell why we are trying to sell what we are trying to create as a value so then, you know, I mean, everyone is coming to the uh, same understanding level. And during this product management and engineering, so uh, as I mentioned, for me, actually, this part is till here, there's a requirement engineering. And from here, the product develop system design product development and the rest is QA, QC or uh, site reliability engineering. So for here, there are, the alignment is mo uh, mostly happening in, uh, program planning 
and also technical verification area. If there is a new concept, then in technical verification, we see that, you know, I mean, is this doable concept or not? So which engineering team is already know from the prior meeting, like why we would like to build that. And if we go for that, there are different, for example, I mean, I was uh, following the last framework. So uh, regarding to my last framework, for example, what we had is we had single product backlog and product management rights, users to epics and the user stories with functional and non-functional acceptance criteria. And we were uh, following the Actan theory. So we were also considering like the system components are the actors. So this is why we were just going with the user stories. There were no tasks. So then we were uh, refining those tickets. And when we go into the sprint, then the engineering was creating the subtasks to be able to fulfill that user stories, functional and uh, non-functional uh, acceptance criteria. Then it was becoming a one pile of requirement that product engineering and everyone is completely aligned. So for uh, all these scrum teams, we had constant backlog also refinements uh, that we were coming together to understand why we are doing what we would like to do. And is it doable? Is it clear, understandable and so on? So we were mostly, I mean, creating the alignment like this. I do see where you're coming from, like having this project uh, product management where you like discovering what is the, the product that you want to build before it goes into actually investment on, on building and as, as you mentioned like building that, uh, that feature proof uh, system of that product but I want to challenge that a little bit because in my experience that is fine but it, it's still not that as fast as you want to be sometimes. So in, in my experience, uh, what we have done uh, so far is uh, like, if you adopt an experimentation approach more extreme, then you actually, what you want is to bring more engineering in that blue zone. And you actually want to build things, but you don't want to build like the future-proof uh, solution. You want to build a bunch of A-B tasks, fake doors, validate things. So you build in no feature proof software, but you build in things and you bring your engineers in that mindset of like build any idea that comes up uh, on that opportunity and concept creation as fast as you can, put it out there, test it. And then yes, those that make it that proof that seems to be like a, a, a revenue stream, you push for the future proof and develop further and scale it and so on. But I don't know if you have also done it this way in, in, in sometimes. So, I mean, uh, over there, maybe I can talk about two things. One of them is, I mean, incremental development, as you mentioned, build something, send it, see the usage. So is it going to fly or not? This is for mostly the incremental models. If the team is constantly building some small things, which is not becoming a usable version. So it means that there is a, problem on the product planning over there, the version planning over there, incremental going. So for example, the wheels are not the MVP. So the skater is MVP and then the bike is second version until you go to the car. So maybe you're supposed to build not reusable things to be able to make it version, but end of the day, I mean, going to the market and stabilizing is important. And the second thing is, again, I mean, for the incremental uh, development stuff, it's different than the waterfall. So this is why for incremental stuff, you have to constantly talk to the customer, constantly ingest the market information and all those information. And for engineering, it is pretty destructive to create all those requirements by considering that. So this is why actually with the uh, incremental development uh, that product management concepts start to be more appeared and more common uh, in our industry. And if still, engineering team is not aware that so uh, for first of all the understanding part is for engineering team there are different levels of uh, involvement so neither product manager nor cto doesn't maybe involve to the uh, testing level into the code or you know i mean so uh, code review level maybe but check some kpis or sometimes all engineers doesn't involve to the overall system design so this is why, I mean, there is kind of a uh, level of involvement over there. 
But in the same time, everyone should be informed about what is going on over there, how much test coverage we have, or what kind of main architectural patterns uh, we are following. So then in that alignment part, one is overall system design, uh, which is lead by mostly CTO, like all that IT strategy and how the uh, technology will be designed. This comes from CTO by also involving all those different disciplines of information rounds, as I mentioned, like market, competitor, and all those prior stuff. And the second thing is for the daily operations, like why we are doing it, what we are going to do, or should we, do we need a, a quick solution or do we need a, any a technical depth or whatever, you know, I mean, for those kind of things is in daily operations of user stories. If you don't know why that functionality is important and what kind of uh, value that we are going to create if it's not clear so uh, then i know that that ticket while they are writing to user story uh, so that 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 so which means that so so that part is really like some product manager wrote something quickly over there to just fill it and go to the acceptance criteria if the ticket is not invest like independent negotiable or uh, estimatable or i mean it doesn't if it's it doesn't fit to the invest model if the requirement is not clear or uh, designed strongly then it's very normal to have those kind of gaps also in refinement sessions if the refinement is not happening properly uh, and regularly to understand from epic level like where we would like to go roadmap level and to the story level so then this also creates those kind of gaps of course i mean there will be always uh, knowledge gaps in every business functions but as far as i see i mean if there is a knowledge gap or something is not going well mostly uh, it's because of some mode of operation mistakes because there are very nice best practices uh, into the market to design to fulfill all those kind of things with my humble experience. To you as well, Tanner, but to, to the open floor, what effect do you think, um, you know, COVID obviously has, has had on innovation as a whole this year? Will there be many, many sort of repercussions from it? But just going on that innovation management framework that you're using, obviously, and Johannes says touched on it as well, the monetar monetization piece, are they sort of, are com do you think companies are trying to speed that process along from obviously concept, MVP, build the product, get to market, try and monetize that? Do you think there's going to be any sort of, you know, blowback on that sort of next year in terms of companies bringing products to market that haven't gone through that proper testing process? So this is again like the designing the product and designing the versions. My opinion, it is extreme critical. I mean, uh, for me, writing the tickets is supposed to take 10 to 15 percent of the time for a successful product manager. The rest should be planning all those kind of things. With my humble opinion, I mean, I have never built something uh, bigger than three months that I can commercialize uh, and immediately start to onboard. Once I did a big product development, like six months or something like that, and it really took three to four more months to stabilize the technology. So this is why going incremental uh, in every two, three sprints, releasing something usable and every maximum three months making something commercializable should be the main concern, my opinion, for the version planning. Uh, but at the same time, like for accelerating that process, this framework that I explained, so in the beginning, it's a big investment to understand all those market dynamics, but after that, it's becoming a reflex into the uh, organization. And also with the strong IT strategy over there, then the scalability uh, can also accelerate those things. But I mean, you guys know better than me, but uh, the engineering is a process like, for example, one lady can give a birth in nine months, but nine ladies cannot give a birth in one month, which means that when you put nine engineers together, it doesn't make nine months test sometimes one month. So this is why there's a always optimal corridor over there to scalability of the engineering team to your delivery pipeline. And at the same time, there's a balance for feeding your uh, backlog and verifying those use cases in the same time, which can accelerate that process. An interesting part of this is actually, I think more of the innovation or change that we're seeing 
at the moment is in organizational models because companies can't work like they used to work. Yeah. I think there was used to be a heavily or a heavy over-reliance on um, co-location and like meetings. And now what you're seeing is like meeting burnout because people are just constantly on Zoom calls and meetings all the time. And it's really hard to work in that way. So, you know, uh, it's really nearly an inversion of like ways of working to, to work in this remote first way. And how do you do innovation in that? Um, in that structure when I think, you know, there was a, like Google relied on co-location to do innovation. Like I read their book recently around how they did it. And they were like, we just put a whole bunch of smart engineers in the same room and then we throw a problem at them and they'll figure it out somehow. You can't do that really anymore. So, you know, that whole way of thinking that was pioneered by Google has collapsed. So question is how do you do innovation now in a remote working structure? I guess is my question. I mean, for me, actually, nothing changed, even in the remote work side, because I mean, for me, even the engineering part or all that part is, I mean, for me, the C level, every C level of the organization has only one KPI, which is return of investment. And this return of investment have a lot of sub KPIs. So uh, same for, I mean, in engineering side too. So while we were before even, before we were giving a technological investment decision, uh, we were checking the return of investment from the three uh, tiers that I explained uh, before. And then instead of like, oh, we should go to HashiCorp or whatever, or no, we should use Wazo because it's so cool or WSO2 is so cool. So instead of the cool and hype technologies, like why do we need it? Why we should use that technology and uh, try to how we call it, measurable for those kind of decisions regarding the return of investment was the main concern for us. So for remote or non-remote, like meetings or not meetings, so those kind of things didn't affect it, at least my engineering team so much because we were following the ceremonies already. Uh, we already had a mode of operation, but also my chance, I mean, my team was in Berlin, in Hamburg, in Italy, in Spain and uh, in a lot of different countries and Italy. So, so this is why we were already very used to work remote. So this is why, I mean, I didn't at least feel so much uh, the problem of that. In the beginning, we had some problems for verification, the use cases and verification of the concepts with the customers, but also so far customers are adapted right now for remote meetings as far as I And it's interesting. I, I do kind of go back to what Payman said earlier around creativity and the process. I, I strongly agree with him on that around, you know, innovation is also a creative process. It's a, it's a you know, you, you get innovative user experiences out of like collaborating with, with groups and things like that. So for a process like you've got there to be the be all and end all for smaller units to be innovative, I think innovation happens at multiple levels. It's mm -hmm. not something do just with a framework so I, I don't know if i would agree with what you said that that you can be innovative and that solves the innovation problem i think the the tricky part especially in the corona time is that everyone still thinks they need to work synchron but they don't have to so we don't need to work always exactly. zoom on synchron everything can happen asynchronous and it's usually so there's a distance between the people but it's much better because a lot of people document stuff and read documentation and stuff like that. So it has up to ups and down, but I think the tricky part is to work from a synchron work experience to an asynchronous work experience. Exactly, exactly. I just wanted to add that, uh, thinking about this asynchronous thing, uh, that for us, one of the most, my most interesting thing that we discovered during this time was the silent meetings, like changes the, the, the the mindset of like working on a document and no much uh, interactions and and uh, I'm working that way like make a huge impact of like uh, how how much things you can co-create if if you create the, the the space to do that instead of just talking one after the other yeah something that worked for us but yeah yeah but Martin I can completely second what you're talking about in terms of innovation we had a leadership offsite yesterday, for example, and we we're like, all right, are we actually becoming a remote first company in the upcoming year? And we we're like, no, we can't. It, it honestly just cannot happen. And we're like, oh, can Miro replace 
does is for innovation. Can Vero do the same thing in terms of collaborative working? No, it can't. And I think there is a absolute impact in terms of how ideas merge together. And I think, especially now, it's so much more important that the silo between several departments is vanishing. The amount of meetings are really much more exponential than ever before. So I completely, completely second the a meeting fatigue as well. It, it starts at seven in the morning and it goes on and you really cannot get out of it. As soon as you're not there in one of the meetings, there is no coffee conversation which will fill you in. This is why that collaboration, especially for the remote times, can cause a huge chaos or can go completely smoothly. So also, I mean, regarding to the creativity, so I mean, I'm talking so much analytical, maybe, I mean, like numbers, numbers, return of investment, but I mean, for creativity, actually, I mean, uh, the creativity is connecting the pieces and coming up with something else. I mean, like to be able to come up with a new color, you have to know some colors and mix it. So the human brain cannot imagine a color which they have never seen it. So the creativity is the same kind of process too. So the whole organization should collaborate properly and collect the right information from each other properly that they can create some creative ideas, new ideas and invention that can go into the innovation processes. So that's why I mean, while I was talking about that mode of operation and that so return of investment topic. So, I mean, I was also meaning that like if there's a proper mode of operation and if all those information is floating properly documented properly and evaluating properly with all the stakeholders then that can also accelerate the creativity process yeah but i think also looking at innovation from a point of view if you have an absolutely innovative product and you know you plan to sell this to another organization probably a bigger one than your own which is the first department that gets cut because of any of our recession or other economic effects, the innovation department, and there goes your product with it. But <laughs> nobody wants to take innovation anymore. And I think it's a, it's a catch 22, and I, I don't think there is a right answer to it, but I'd love to see if you know, or hear from any of you on, if you're dealing with the same thing, or you know, is this also hitting you back? I can second that actually. I can say that um, Richard, I'm happy that you brought this topic up. I wanted to ask Tanner something similar. Uh, we, and I want to speak also to, to Payman's uh, point that you brought up about creativity. I work for a larger organization and our creativity comes from within larger teams. But for us, I think that really it's the, the creativity is it's taken a hit because of we've been nine months almost going on nine months of Zoom, you know, remote. And it feels like our creativity comes from a very tight knit culture that we've always had, where we all understand and trust each other and understand the responsibilities of the different functions and can easily communicate quickly with each other and know that we can pass off the different steps of delivering on the innovation amongst each other very quickly. And since we've been remote, it's been such a long time now that I've in one area I've spun up two, two teams. And in these two teams, the, all the engineers have never met each other ever. They're people who have only ever met over Zoom. Just, just last night, um, one of them, everybody discovered that one of them was in uh, Augsburg and we all thought that everyone was in Berlin. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty funny. And, and just and yesterday also, um, I was talking with one of the leads and he was on one of these teams. He was pulling his hair out in how it's taken almost six months to actually deliver on a, on, on a project that they've been working on. And we really owe it to the fact that we can't, we really have not really established that, that cultural sync together. It's been a lot longer in uh, using these tools like Miro and, and collaborating over Jira or whatever, or Slack. And like you said, Tanner, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's for us, it's taken just the time that we would be able to innovate much faster. And we've just seen it lengthen out a lot longer to, to, to take, to go out that much further. And that's, that's what we've seen. That's what's happened to us it's just a time thing that's come to us, you know, but it's over Zoom. Also, did you observe any changes or any speed up on onboarding new engineers uh, after the remote work? Or when you mix up some uh, engineering team or raise a new scrum team, the adaptation speed of the team to each other? 
The onboarding, no, that actually, it's, um, it, it always happens very um, virtually anyways, over the JIRA and the accounts, the controlling team, the contracts, the procurement, whoever. That actually is, is been about the same, but um, the getting the teams all on the same page with how they're going to do agile mm -hmm. and the, the showcases that they do and whatever, the rituals, as you mentioned, those have actually taken a lot longer to sink in. You know, and because of the, uh, the, the meeting fatigue, I mean, I'll second that it's, I used to like to do very frequent one-on-ones with, with everyone. And I would go down to each of the engineers even, and, and try to do regular one-on-ones with them. But that is that feedback cycle has lengthened, you know, it's now two or three weeks before I get a chance to speak with one of the leads or something. That's been a little bit of frustration. So if there's calibrations that need to be made in the team or readjustments to things, it takes a long time to discover that and really mm -hmm. and, and change course there. So, I mean, in I, terms of what we do with just getting the feeling in for, you know, still feeling that the teams are together and still having the same thing as an online experience, for example, is that we initiate a coffee afternoon whenever there's someone new joining in and you know you just have to be there and the coffee is across the company so you know you might not have a lot of people join in but then you have this special coffee session mm -hmm. which is on everyone's calendar and it is specifically to get to know the newbies there's actually a cool tool. I'll double up down on that. We, we've done something similar and I really like the idea. There's a tool called Donut, which Donut. you can add to yes. Yes. Set all those things up. And our team have really liked it so far. So like things like that to kind of try and semi, uh, like like the please said is to semi emulate some of these same experiences, I think is really good. But I think there's a point at which it's trying to emulate the old experience rather than innovate and actually create something which is different that can like leverage the fact that uh, of creating a better remote culture that is remote centric rather than trying to emulate old practices. Yeah. And I, I don't know what that looks like yet. It's we yeah. sometimes in some of the GitLab have late that you have to put a virtual background or you have to wear the uh, mm -hmm. some, you know, a virtual overlay on you just just to have fun or you somebody gets the task of telling a story from their weekend on monday you know as well yeah, we are also playing some games i mean bi-weekly we have events for example i mean if there are special newbies five six people for example i mean each meeting there's a different concept but last one for example uh, the new ones they were telling some stories and the rest of the uh, people, the whole organization were voting that, is that story true or false? And then, you know, <laughs> the winners are getting something for their home. Uh, if you can fake your story or, I mean, mislead the organization, then you are getting some awards. So those kind of games were very working, very well working. The, the, the difference really, and that's, that's key in some of the things that people have been saying, are we trying to do what we used to do in a different medium, which is not suitable? Now, when you used to get together in a meeting room with post-its and pin them on the walls and yell at each other and like run around and steal each other's post-its and like do stuff, that doesn't work in Miro. Miro is a great tool, but that's not the same. And in Zoom, you can't all yell at each other for five minutes. Like it doesn't work. And like, I, I don't mean like yelling as in nasty yelling, but like you have an argument and you're like, you know, you know, like you're wrong and that's stupid. And like, I hate that idea. We have to do it the other way. And like, and when you're there, like physically, the human mind can process that. Zoom can't process that. Like if anybody tries to talk while I'm talking, you don't get heard. And then it's all like, we have to wait and take turns. I wish there were some real life meetings in my past life where people had waited and taken turns. That would have been really nice too, but it's not the same. And so, if we want to innovate and we want to do things, it's not the right thing to replicate what we used to do before um, in a different medium, because you can't, it's not the same. Doing things asynchronously is another evolution, just instead of doing stuff online. We say, okay, it's okay that we're not all together. We have a shared document or a shared work object, code, whatever, and we work on it you know, one after another. And then we see the results as they grow and we don't have to be there all at the same time. Meetings are a silo ultimately. 
you know, so removing them from the actual, the, the processes is, is in a way an optimization and it gets rid of this fatigue of, of, of like point, but also it gets rid of some of the siloing that happens in meetings. Was someone not invited? Was it just for a particular group? Did some stuff get decided that no one actually said to anyone because um, it wasn't documented properly? So getting rid of like meetings actually is, I think, an overall net benefit, but People are so used them as a crutch so much now that it's a real, nearly emotional thing. I've got people got upset when I was like, "Yeah, we should just basically get rid of meetings as much as possible." People were like, "Ah, oh, but, 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 but," and that's okay. But you have to replace it with something. One thing we've done is kind of replacing it with, like Discord, where people can just talk, but it's not for making decisions, yeah. and anyone can connect to a Discord channel and just like jump in. You just talk talk shit if you want to talk shit maybe work together collaborate on stuff people can jump in and out of it but it's not for making decisions on because that should always be done in an asynchronous format and making people understand the distinction between decision making as one thing and don't you don't use meetings for that and like sort of operational stuff where you're just trying to get shit done and that can be done with like things that are always on always open like never having closed meetings for it, et cetera, is, is a different way of working. And it, it confused the hell out of me at first trying to get used to it, but I, I think it's working. I think I what think we're all people... acknowledging is that we can't just say, when we used to go to a room and figure things out, uh, replacing that with, we all jump on a call and figure things out, that doesn't work. That's not a one-to-one -one okay. correlation. But there are many ways in which we can now replace that and often with something better onboarding can be something well now it's documented and you don't just tap the person sitting next to you on your shoulder anymore instead you have a process for this and everybody profits or you have silent meetings where you collaborate on a document and there's an outcome and those who weren't in the meeting see that document and you've still been in a meeting but you've been productive together and not just talked about random stuff and then documented nothing or you can facilitate meetings in other ways that you have a little bit of a workshop break where you pair up in groups of two for 10 minutes and then you come back and present your conclusions. So you need to really much more actively facilitate the meeting time though. I think you've yeah. made a really good point. You used the word a few times here and that's facilitate. And the biggest thing that has changed is even more so the importance of really good facilitators, agile coaches, and these things to make sure like the people who wouldn't get hurt otherwise can get hurt, make sure things like run smoothly and actually having dedicated people who are thinking about how that works and who are those people is a really interesting question because often that falls onto, previously I've seen it fall onto product owners all the time and they are categorically the wrong person to be doing that because they're not objective. They're not an outside party and they can become authoritarian through it i've seen it a lot and they're so, often very loud and taking up all the yeah. space themselves then. exactly 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 i think it's a mix though because some people crave this access to meetings because it's their last bastion of human communication you know like with adults not with their own children like i spent like three months basically at home with my two kids while my wife was at work she's a, a therapist so she couldn't stay at home and in that time, it was just like, yeah, everybody in my meetings got to know my kids. I got to know my kids a lot better. It was fantastic. But like, I did like to actually have adult conversations with people sometimes as well. So actually meeting with people and giving that opportunity to talk about stuff is really useful, but it's not necessarily work. And I've split it like every Friday night at about 5 p.m. Berlin time, I have an open session, like an ask me anything session for an hour. So my American teams can jump on with me. They have coffee. My South African teams and the European teams all usually turn up with a glass of wine or a beer or something. And I've explicitly made two very distinct rules for this meeting. No work, bring a beverage of your choosing and wear pants. Must wear pants to attend the meeting. And that's what it says in my invite. You know? And you, it can be a pants equivalent. You know, It can be a dress or a skirt, but it can't be a bathing suit or a towel. Like when I emailed this to people, the mini invite, I'm kind of, I got replies back going, what do you mean like wear pants? I'm like, seriously, just turn up, wear pants, it'll be fine. And that made people realize it wasn't actually work time. It was supposed to be fun. 
anybody who rolls up at 8 a.m. 8 on a Friday in America, it's, you know, it's too early for real work. 5 p.m. European time or South African time is too late for real work on a Friday. So they all understand that it's not actually work and it's just there to talk about, you know, what's the corona situation like in their countries? What's the, like, what movies are they watching? How are they staying sane? And this kind of stuff. And that, to me, is my most valuable weekly meeting. It's absolutely nothing to do with work, but people have a chance to interact in a semi-normal way at home, in whatever state they're in. I've ruled out, like, nobody's allowed to have a virtual background. I don't care what it looks like, but you just have to, like, turn up. You can't turn up to a meeting at work without pants, and you can't turn up with a virtual background. So for that meeting, those rules apply. And that's gone down really well, and that's really helped with motivation. The work stuff, we're trying to move to more synchronous stuff, but it's hard. Like, if people have been doing this for years and years, and it's like, I'm in a huge company. We've got 6,500 people. You can't get them to, like, be new suddenly. So it's, like, kind of, like, little slices, little steps. But we have a bunch – we have Rocket Chat, so we have uh, – 50,000 rocket chat channels for different stuff. And if you have a question, you ask in the front end channel or the back end channel or the I don't know where to ask channel or like, you know, and that works really well. That works well between the different time zones too. But it's a matter of getting these, lining up these different things. Your how are you on rocket chat with 6,500 people? You only subscribe to the rooms where you're interested in. No, but rocket chat. I mean, I, I, this, I would take this probably a conversation offline. Just rocket chat as a tool. Most, most of them don't use it, so it's basically like my teams like own it and use it, and everybody else is like come, come as you will. So we've, we've probably got about two hundred and fifty active users. So it's not as bad as it sounds. Okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Tanner, thanks a lot for for putting the time into that and, and the science and stuff. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say yeah. Thanks a lot.